All right, hello there. So welcome to, I guess this is technically episode or session two of the Haskell cast, or no, this isn't the Haskell cast. This is uh, Haskell Live Coding. Um, last time we sat down and built a whole library full of uh, commutative applicative functors. Um, and at the end of the session, everyone kind of asked me if I'd be willing to do a general like Q and A session. So I'm throwing the doors pretty wide open. Um, if anybody has any questions about Haskell, let's hear them and get started and go from there. Um, whenever there's quiet, I'm just going to code. So I will fill the silence if I have to. Um, also, if um, anybody is new around here, there's a Discord chat, which is linked below the video here, and you can pop in there and the general audio channel should pop up on stream for now. Oh, I can see through my hair. Do, do, do headshot camera. Filters. Chroma key. Make my hair a little less translucent. There. I am a solid being. What is the best Haskell operator? Oh man, they're starting with the tough ones. Um, dot. Function composition is the best Haskell operator. What is the best in life? All right. Since we're getting off to a slow start here, I'm going to switch things over to uh, a coding screen so I can actually write some code and go from there. And of course, unplug everything in the process. Awesome. And new monitor arrangement does not immediately crash out when I do that, so progress. Whew. Yes, if we, if we really want to be highbrow, there is always the operator. Okay, so um, let me see if I can actually see the Twitch chat in stream here. Hi, Bing. Welcome to the chat. Do you have any questions about Haskell? All right. Um, last time we, we wrote this little library for commutative applicative functors and we started to sketch how we could uh, um, deal with probability distributions. And at the time I had to go off to some random website in order to sketch a solution. Now I actually have a, uh, a pen and paper here and another camera set up on it. So I can answer questions that uh, need me to draw something. Um, in particular, the thing that I was trying to describe last time was how to deal with um, drawing samples from a very high dimensional probability distribution. And so there I was using a technique called uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, MCMC. And MCMC sampling is based on the idea that if you just had some function where the area under this curve integrates out to some constant, so the integral under the curve of f of x dx is a constant, um, but that constant isn't necessarily one, then here, let me actually throw the Discord overlay on the screen so we can see it while I'm drawing. Um, and you wanted to draw a you want to draw samples from this thing that's proportional to a probability density function, but isn't actually a probability density function then uh, what you could do is you, you could start with some point at which you had non-zero probability mass. So you have f of x here, such that f of x is greater than zero. And some way to add 
some kind of mutation, like you have some probability of transitioning from X to Y that is symmetric. Um, so that you might try and add some normal amount of noise or whatever to your current location and either go downhill or uphill. And if you go uphill, you'll always accept the move. And if you go downhill, you kind of roll a dice based, based on like the proportion of the new height to the old height. And uh, if you pass the, the, the die roll, you take the new position. Otherwise, you stay where you're at. And uh, yeah, not, um, I don't have uh, Lambda Bot running. I suppose I can start her up. Well, that's not going to give me bang up time. Um, so anyway, so this thing was great in one dimensions. And then to deal with higher dimensions, there were techniques that can exploit the derivative of the function at any given point in time. So if I had a way to automatically compute the derivative of a function, um, then I could exploit the slope information in order to do fancier sampling. So the, the, the main motivation that I had for this commutative um, monad was to start talking about things where if I have, say, a two-dimensional distribution, I will move over here, um, and I had, some, say, you know, x and y, and let's just draw an ellipse one standard deviation away from the origin or something like that. Like to say we have some some normally distributed thing that's just a Gaussian in multiple dimensions. So it's it's like a lump here. Then I could hold all dimensions but one con constant and then just look at like a slice through this distribution, which is going to integrate out to some constant, take a point that I'm currently at, mutate my point to another point on that curve, and then hold the other dimensions constant and then mutate within this dimension. So I'd move, I'd make a series of small moves in individual axis alignment. But it's not a terribly good technique when you have like lots of uh, correlation between your two input features. Like if you have a distribution that has um, a lot of correlation between say our X, and our, our X and our Y dimension here, then you take lots of little baby steps in order to cross this space. So any correlation is going to destroy your ability to move. Hello, Dr. Ninja Batman. Hey. You are the first person to join the audio chat since we actually got it working on the stream. <laughs> um. So anyways, this is me filling silence, so feel free to ask any questions you have about Haskell. Um, smart or dumb, newbie or old bee, um, anything about any of my libraries, whatever. I'm, my intention there is to throw this open. Could I, could I do principal component analysis and move along a different base? Yes, if your model has um, a global kind of principal component analysis uh, like property, but if, if it's like got a long thin valley over here and a bunch of productive space over here and a bunch of productive space over here and then goes into these long thin valleys to connect all these spaces, then PCA isn't a very good tool. So what you use, what we'll use, what we used to do a lot of, a lot of times in probability theory was, or in um, like Bayesian, Bayesian statistics was like add one feature to our model at a time. Whereas um, nowadays, one of the sort of go-to tools is something that's used by a library called Stan in the C++ library, or in the C++ community, or um, it's, uh, it's a technique called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, where instead of trying to move independently in each one of the dimensions using Gibbs sampling, what we'll do is instead take this whole probability distribution that we have over here and basically flip the whole thing upside down. And now my peaks have become super deep valleys. And I'm oversimplifying, there's a log involved. Um, and my current sample has become like a frictionless puck. And then I do a sort of physics simulation to let this thing go skitter down through valleys after I flick it with some amount of initial random momentum. And now I have the problem of how hard do I flick? 
Um, how long do I let this thing go? Um, I've created that problems with, with introducing a notion of time. But once I've done that, it turns out that this can handle very, very high dimensional probability distributions uh, just fine. But there's some cases where the Gibbs sampling stuff really works out well, um, which is that if these two features are completely independent, we've already established that uh, Gibbs sampling doesn't cost me anything. As a matter of fact, this original sampling technique was to say, hey, look, I have to move in X and I'll either accept or reject the entire position. Um, and if they're independent, what I could do is I could move in X and accept or reject the move in X and then move in Y and accept or reject the move in Y completely independent of each other. So if I had like 250,000 dimensions and let's just say for simplicity's sake that I had like a 90% chance of accepting every one of those moves, then, um, the idea that you can move indi individually in each one of those dimensions yeah, I have to, I'll have to do that afterwards. Um, Eric, nothing. Uh, Eric, Eric, anything. Um, where was I going with that? Um, so if I were to move individually in each one of those dimensions, then like 0 0.9 to the 250,000 is going to be a very, very small number, which is basically indistinguishable from zeros. My odds of accepting any of the moves is basically non-existent. So if I can capture... Um, as much of the independent features that I want in my little probability monad, then I would be able to um, move forward with um, actually making progress in my lifetime. So that, that was sort of the motivating thing behind the commutative library from the other day. Um, I started to try and sketch this up at the end of the talk and we re or the, the session and we just didn't have a decent enough medium in order to present it. Does, um, does commutative, uh, commutative apply to a decision to use either of these patterns, A to B to B and B to A to B, or is it A to A to A? Uh, commutativity, um, I'm using commutativity as commutativity on a, a binary function, and a function on, on, on one data type, so A to A to A. There are generalizations of the concept, but nothing that I need right now. So yeah, we we have the, we have the paper now, Paula. I can actually um, sketch for once. It was between this and a whiteboard, and this one. All right. Um, so, since the questions are not flying fast and loose, uh, let's go back to the coding screen. Let me see if this thing actually still builds. Yay. Well, I mean, uh, Dr. Ninja Batman, uh, <laughs> I have to say that out loud every time. That's going to be great fun. Um, the, the issue is whether or not that can even type check. Can I reiterate how I was thinking about applicative in the design last week? So... Let me pull up control commutative here. So the idea was to take a, a applicative functor and then add commutativity to it, which was the idea that in some cases that we want to have um, G. That it doesn't matter the order in which your applicative effects happen. Does that help?
Pretty random question, but I recently saw that the hash tables package is significantly slower than hash tables in other languages. Python, do you know how to, uh, if the problem is an implementation or a deficiency in GHC? Um, I do know that there's some problems with if you follow through um, a lot of, is, uh, oh wait, I should actually, thank you. I'm sorry, I was on the wrong screen here. Coding. I don't actually have a coding screen that has the chat up, which I should, I should which is a deficiency I should re remedy. Um, I'll do that for next time. This is the law that I was writing. I'll dump it in, in chat. There. All right. Um, so popping back over to Q&A. Uh, Co-creatures scrolled off the screen here. I'm going to have to get more careful about how I fit these chat things together. Um, so is the hash table stuff slow for a fundamental reason in Haskell, or is it uh, um, because of uh, implementation? I, as far as I know, it um, hash tables work fine in GHC. I've managed to implement a small hash table using simple tabulation hashing, and it had competitive performance. What is my criteria for writing my own monad instance instead of a bunch of normal functions? Um, generally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a monad whenever I'm in a... Uh, when I'm trying to stitch together a sequence of operations of some sort that feel like either a sequence of instructions or something along those lines. Um, as for using the free monad, um, let's go build a free monad. We'll just do it from scratch. Um, so the free monad... For a given functor f here, it looks like this. You're either an a or you're free of f of free of. FA. So you have a a or an f of an a or an f of an a or etc. And so what is this? This is uh, return is pure and pure a bind to f is just the monad law, one of them. And then free a's bind to f is, well, we're going to build up the layer of free, bind this to my function, and then map that over a's. And I'm not in the coding scene, again, because I have this stupid preview thing going. All right, let me go back to coding. All right, I'll, I'll get better at this, I promise, guys. Um, we'll just do deriving functor, and then instance functor f gives me applicative free f. Okay, so pure is pure, and app will just is app, which we can get from. So we've got all the boilerplate to have the notion of a free monad. So what is what is a free monad, right? It is a series of layers of some data type F, which if I flip over to, aha, I have a coding and drawing view. Um, so like if I had a very simple base functor, like let's, let's make a data type bin, bin AA. Say that that's a functor. Then free of bin is going to be a notion of a binary tree. Because what you have is you either have an A or you have a bin of an A. You have of two trees, basically. So you can say, like, you know, uh, type tree is free bin, and we can work with tree. And then when we look at the, the tree itself, we either have a, a tip, like a pure node, or we have a bin, a free bin, which holds on to two things, which are either tips or bins in their own right. Uh, Lavin, this is, we're talking about Haskell. It's a functional programming language.
And uh, Dr. Ninja Batman's rule of thumb is that if you have more than three functions accepting a, the same type of argument, you need a reader, writer, state monad. Um, I generally follow that same kind of flow. Um, I'm a little bit more willing to write piles of pure functions until I get a sense of what I'm actually using. All right, um, so with our free bin, now what you've got is the monad here, pure, is going to just give you back a value, like it's going to take an A and give me back just a single node with my A in it. Is that readable at all? Let me see if I can zoom in. Whereas if I had a um, tree here with decorated the leaves with values, let's say one, two, three, and you gave me a function from int to uh, free bin, say whatever, um, I don't know, I'll say units. Um, so it takes one to something and something else. Then what we'll do is we're going to build a new tree for each one of these. And then we're going to graft them on as the action of the monad. This is what, what a free monad does, is it kind of replaces the leaves and it continues to grow the tree down. Is free related to fix? They're very closely related. Um, you can sort of view free as fix of the composition of, um, what is this? This is like a sum type of like either A or something like that. And your base functor. And I'm not in the code screen yet. Damn it. Code and drawing. All right. So this is um, our notion of uh, like how fix relates to free. I have a short article I wrote uh, called Reflecting on Incremental Folds, which talks about that briefly. This was 2009 or so. Um, and I'll just paste the link in the chat. All right. So anyways, so free monads are, are basically all about trees and grafting. There's a, um, there's a paper by Tamro Estalu and some other folks, which is rather inaccessible. It says the dual of substitution is redecoration. Um, and this paper is really how I learned to think about comonads. And it has the um, sort of distinctive flavor. It has a rather distinctive flavor to it. The idea is that if you look at a monad, basically what we're doing with a monad is we have bind, which is taking an M of A and giving me back an action from A to M of B, and then giving me an M of B. And we can implement this in terms of M bind to F is uh, join dot F map or join of F map M of M. So this is basically what we're doing is we're taking our monad full of A's. We're going into the leaves whatever, or we're going and finding all the A's, re replacing them. We're substituting M of B's for all the A's. And then we, we get an M of M of B's. And then we're joining to smash things together. So that's a we do a, like a substitution step and then we do like a renormalization step to smash things flat. That's the way monads work. Um, with free monads, the renormalization step is trivial. All you're doing is the grafting. So there was a question about how the two different monad or how the two different things in free T FMA work together. Um, so let's go look at that. Package, package, free. Control monad trans, free. Okay, so there's two things here. So we have what 
what is this thing? It's um, we're going to wind up with m of a or f of m of a or f of m of. So we start with an m on the outside here. It's a slightly different construction. An m here has to be a monad, or f can be a functor. So why do we care? Well, free is free lies in its current incarnation. I actually need to do a new release of the library at some point that will finally remove the monad trans instance for free. Um, not free t, but free has a bunch of illegal instances on it. This violates the laws. This violates the laws all over the place. And um, if I remember right, there was a monad trans instance in here. Maybe not. Maybe I was, yeah, monad trans free is a complete lie. <clears throat> this is not a monad transformer. Um, but if you look at free T, I can actually embed M effects properly because M really is a monad here. Does MB require that MA be evaluated first? I'm not sure that, um, that follows in any meaningful capacity. If you look at like first is like a notion of sequencing. The IO monad happens to have a notion of sequencing, but sequencing isn't really inherent to monads. Um, so anyways, so what can we do with this? So I have a monad for, um, I called it iter t. So let's say that you wanted to have a Let's, uh, let's just build a particular thing. We could build a monad for partiality. Partial A is uh, total A or partial, partial A. We can build a monad for partial where pure is total or return is total and where, I'll get rid of the free docs and where we have Total A bind to F is just a monad law. And partial A's bind to F is partial of, however, A's bind to F. Okay. And then we need to bolt in our deriving functor and our instance applicative partial boilerplate. We're in a modern GHC, I don't need that. Okay, so this partiality monad is is kind of a nice toy because what you can do is you can use it for computations that you want to give some amount of fuel to. So what you'll do is you'll run you can run this monad, say, for 50 layers of partial constructors or something like that. And here we have a delay, which is just the partial constructor. And so you can count the number of delays you've done. Did I mess up my partial? Yes, it does. That's what I get for moving fast. Okay. Okay, so this, this guy is an instance of free t, if we're very careful. Uh, with free t, we get, again, we had that m of a or of f of m of a or F of, and the choice here is that M is going to be the, uh, let's see if I can get this right. I need to build a, so this is a free T, but I'm gonna be, free, I'm working with free T where the base monad is identity of identity. A or an A or an A or an AR. Yeah, that's okay. This is partial is like free T identity identity. Okay. So the idea with like this notion of inner T is inner T M or F M or inner T M is free T identity M. So this gives me sort of the 
Um, I don't have any interesting F structure, but my I have layers of M's that are separated by invoking this notion of like delay, which can be implemented more generically. So, um, so for free T, basically what you have is you have layers of monadic effects that get collapsed in between layers of like messages or whatever you want to, however you want to interpret the F's in your functor. Does this definition relate to function totality? Um, Dr. Ninja Batman, basically the idea here is what you can do is you can work in this partial monad. So a function from A to partial B is a function that I can run and then check to see if it's done and then I can give it more fuel. So we can we can get all fancy and start doing an instance of Comanad for partial or something like that, which is dangerous. Or extract total A is A. Extract and then duplicate here is going to take a total and give me a total A and duplicate. Partial A's is a partial of duplicate A's, I think. Uh, this one doesn't really matter. And I'm not going to import coming out of make that right. I leave that as a homework exercise. Well, it's not like a tool to prove totality within a monad or something. No, total in... Uh, the, the partiality monad here is useful is used a lot in languages like Agda where you start working with a proof that you can you have some notion of progress that you, you can make or something like that and you don't necessarily know that the thing makes progress but you can give it some amount of fuel and let it try and run So this is this is probably the best example of using the the free T pattern or the iter T pattern, which is just the other like if 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 you view free how free relates to iter T or free how free relates to free T, iter T is the other half of it. There it is control mona trans iter iter m. This is m of either an A or iter T M A. So this is the M on the outside, but without the F's layered between. So it just gets rid of all the identities. All right. So we, we we're starting to ask, like, how do you use free monads? So the major use case for me for free monads is that um, what I'll do is if I if I don't know what how I want to implement something, like if I have like a like a sketch of a little programming language or a library or something like that, I'm like, I know I'm going to need some kind of monad. It's going to need some operations that look kind of like these. One point where I might start is to design a free monad, where a free monad is going to just have the set of operations that I need. And then what I can do is I can define my interpreters for how to implement that later. And then I can define things in terms of like monad homomorphisms from my free monad into an interpreter for it. And then eventually what I'll do is I'll just get rid of the free monad if I only need one interpreter or something. So that, that's how I use free monads in practice where I'm talking about free monads in the, in the very Haskell-y term of free monad. Um, there's also like the concept of freeness in category theory, which pops up all over the place which the free monad is just one special case of. And I use that a lot. By the way, how are the audio levels and whatnot I haven't actually tested? Ah, is sequence A dot to list equivalent to fmap to list dot sequence A? That's a good question. Um, sequence A of to list. I would think that one actually passes. There's a general question of whether or not 
um, like fold map is fold map dot to list and stuff like that. And that one actually breaks down. But I think the sequence A example that you just gave does pass uh, statistologists. Sequence A of two list. Well, I think the the issue is going to be more that if you can convert, if you can successfully terminate converting to list, it'll work on either side of that. Can I give more examples of the C? What C? A to M of B that motivates free. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I gave one example here with which just involved using like a like a binary tree, right? Because then what you have is the free monad for bin here is the notion of binary trees with grafting. You you basically take um, binary trees that have values at their leaves. You have functions from the values at the leaves to new binary trees, and you build bigger binary trees. Would that strategy not apply in other languages with free monads? Um, well, when I say free monad, um, there's even in just this project that we were talking about, there's the notion of um, free monad relative to what? Anything free is relative to what you forget. And so free monads have been kind of run with in the Haskell ecosystem as free relative to the um, functor from the category of monads to the category of endofunctors on Hask that forgets that you have a monad. Um, so like the example with the commutative library that I have here, I started building up the free monad relative to a commutative applicative functor, which is a rather different free. Um, so anyway, so back to um, Edmund Cape's uh, question about other examples of a free monad. So like what I might do is I might say, well, I want a monad terminal M, where in this thing I want to be able to get a char. I'm just going to come up with a name. This is going to be an M of char, and I want to be able to put a character, which is going to be you give me a char, and I'll give you an M of unit. So I could define something like this, and then later on build my monad that has this like terminal support. Um, but if I didn't know how I wanted to interpret this yet, and I just wanted to be able to like play around with lots of different interpreters, what I could do is I could make a data type for um, like these terminal effects, and then have something like, well, this is there exists a getcher constructor which is an uh, if you give me a char to an A, I will give you a getcher of A, or a terminal of A, and a putcher, which takes a char and gives me a terminal of unit. And then if I derive functor on terminal, I think I might have to write this one by hand. And I should actually, I want this to be a functor. This is not going to be a functor. Now it is. And now I can turn around and um, use the other syntax, which is the um, Butcher, butcher. 
I'll just derive functor. I don't need to write it. And now a free terminal has these operations and we could define like instance of monad terminal for my free terminal and add like get sure is um, free of get sure the constructor here and see if I do this right and I have to pass this thing pure or something like that and put sure is free of put sure by a and it's currently going to give me back a unit so this would give me a data type that represents all of the getting and putting that I'm going to do and then what I could do is I could write an interpreter that would then walk this data type to do the things that I want to do to actually run this into any particular monad Does that illustrate anything? So there's some problems with what I've sketched here, which is that I did free of some particular terminal type. And so if you wanted to have several of these kind of constraints, you probably want to have like some kind of constraint on what is the functor that is underneath this, um, this free monad and whatnot. Uh, this, is, this pattern is fairly useful for testing and the like. If you, have like a, if you want to do mocking in Haskell test suites, then one pattern for that is just put all the operations that you want to use in your library in some kind of class or bury it in a backpack module and then parameterize your entire code base over it. And then you can build an instantiation of that module or that type class um, for some kind of thing in free inside of your test suite. And then you'll be able to in in inspect all of the things that you were doing in the monad. So those are the kind of patterns where I use the free monad a lot. I use the more general construct of uh, a free construction and all sorts of things. So like you can find like all the, all the stuff that we have on Yoneda and CoYoneda and um, density and co-density and all that stuff in Haskell winds up being these free and co-free constructions. So if you look at, um, if you want the, the, like the super advanced version of this, categories of structures in Haskell. There's a, blog post that Dan Dole wrote up on my blog, which talks about the more general notions of free and co-free and then sees things like Yoneda, et cetera, through those. So you can start to see co-Yoneda as the free functor relative to a data constructor of kind star to star. All right, other questions? We've actually managed to, to hit the like fairly hot and heavy um, piles of programming questions that I was hoping for this session. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. You are officially the first person to throw bits my way. I just gained the ability to accept them right before this talk. Differences between rank and types and existentials. Um, who, uh, well, rank and types give you universal quantifiers and existentials give you um, existential quantifiers. Uh, <laughs> we have, you can use like double negation to, to implement existentials using rank and types. You can combine multiple sets of operations using coproducts. Yeah, so the free sum terminal network question uh, example that uh, is it cake of pork uh, suggested uh, works reasonably well. There's a there's a whole cottage industry of how to deal with open sum types in Haskell. Uh, do you use data types a la carte? Do you use like some kind of other H listy thing or uh, vinyl records and their dual 
there's all sorts of things that you can describe that handle like open cases like that. The approach that I tend to use is to like work with lenses and then build a pile of prisms that get into my state. And then I can work with some kind of thing like class hat uh, as terminal T where um, what do we have here? We want terminal or underscore terminal is a prism from T to terminal. And then uh, what I would do is instead of having monad terminal for free terminal, I would have, well, if there is a prism that can pick out the terminal parts of my base functor f to do here I want f of a goes to terminal a and then this is how I would implement like the monad terminal stuff and then instead of doing get chur and stuff like that I would have to inject with terminal It, considering they're implicit for alls anyways, why do you use explicit for alls with scope type variables? Is that an arbitrary decision? Yes, it is an arbitrary decision. What happened is if um, scope type variables were added to the language after the fact, they weren't there in like the original Haskell report. In the Haskell, re like, the Haskell report, you could turn around and define you know, foo as a function from a to bool or something like that, and then foo equals something where, and then inside of here, you could put another thing with a completely unrelated type signature. And this A and this A don't have to be related. The quantifier here is really just a trick for introducing scope. So it says this one actually binds underneath here. And since you, um, it was a way to repurpose something that didn't already exist in the language because Haskell 98 didn't have a for all keyword. So no code that was trying to rely on the old Haskell 98 behavior could be broken by the assumptions added by scope type variables. So scope type variables say, hey, look, you turn this on, and then when you use the quantifier, the quantifier implies scope. If we had it to do over again and we're in a language that didn't have any backwards compatibility issues, would we? Say, would I say that maybe scope type variables should be the default? That'd be great. Um, there are some consequences to it, like uh, when we were working on our little programming language, Ermine at uh, SP, we couldn't support scope type variables because of the kind of type checker that we were using. We were using something called HMF from uh, Don Lyon. Um, and so like there are Hindley Milner adjacent type check, uh, type systems that maybe you don't, maybe you can't express the for all that we want here nicely in. So there, there's a very weak argument for saying that maybe it shouldn't be the default in a, in a programming language. I don't know. And we're actually starting to get people in the voice chat. Nobody's actually chatting. Okay, Jack. So a specific question for one of your projects. One of the GitHub issues for your propagators library is how to implement provenance. Could you give some pointers on how to proceed with it? In your opinion, um, is propagators relates to logic programming? How is propagators in general related to logic programming, knowledge representation, and reasoning? Um, and I guess we, we just got started at noon, so we've been running for about 45 minutes now. The intention is to probably run until about 4 p.m. Uh, so as for propagators, um, how to put this? So there, there's, a, there's a pretty deep connection, I think, between propagators and all of the extended logic stuff that you can do in various flavors of... Sorry, we don't have the bot for uptime. Um, for me, the... Um, so as for provenance, the, there's, a, there's a few stories about how to deal with provenance. If you look at Alexei Radul's paper, there's a thesis that Alexei Radul wrote with uh, Jerry Sussman. Uh, 
on propagators. And this thesis, The Art of the Propagator, is the origin of the idea, thank you, um, of a propagator. So I'll, I'll first dump this here, just in case anyone's curious about propagators. There's a couple of talks I've given on them that are fairly introductory, uh, or one that's introductory, one that kind of just dives deep on whatever I was thinking about at the time, um, as my talks are wont to do. The approach that's given here has the wrong asymptotic performance. In particular, when they start talking about provenance, they um, adapt an approach from an old Lisp book, which is lying on my shelf back behind me somewhere. And um, that book um, implements provenance by sort of considering the explosion of the power set of all um, sources of possible provenance. And if you, if you work it out, that turns a problem that um, into a larger complexity class than it needs. It's, uh, Catalan, it's a wonderful thesis. I really wish, like, my only complaint about it is as a, as a mathematician, I really wish that there was more effort put into the laws. Like, I know Sussman really wanted Radul to um, uh, try and like speak in a open and enthusiastic way to, to bring people into the idea of propagators rather than belabor the laws but like that that's that's been my major issue with the with the thesis overall um so anyways um so the issue around using propagators for tracking provenance so one of the solutions that i was playing with before was to turn around and say uh, let me see if i can switch this back over to coding and drawing maybe um so what is it? Let, let, me, let me give a brief overview of what the heck a propagator is so I'm not just talking past half or 90% of the audience. The idea of a propagator is, if, if anyone here knows what a join semi-lattice is, it's a commutative uh -huh, uh, monoid that happens to be idempotent. That means that A join A is A. Okay, and... Uh, it's commutative, so it fits into everything else that we talked about in the last session or so. And hello to Hungary. Um, uh, propagator is a monotone function in my vocabulary, not in Alexi's. Alexi doesn't actually, I think, formalize this in any way. Um, is to say that a propagator is a monotone function between joined semi-lattices. Which means that if I gain, in, like, you can view the, the, the semi-lattices here as, like, the amount of information I know about individual values. And as I gain information about inputs, I can only gain information about the outputs. And then there are some fairly broad conditions under which if you had a whole system full of nodes that each individually had different joined semi-lattices in them, and you had a bunch of these propagators moving information around between them, that the answer, or the steady state, like if every time this thing gained information, you cause the propagators out of it to fire and pass the information along, it doesn't matter if they fire too many times because it's idempotent, um, it doesn't matter the order in which they happen because it's commutative, then this whole, and we have side conditions that can guarantee that this terminates, and then under those assumptions, this whole network will terminate and give a deterministic answer, even though the order in which it evaluates things may be completely um, all over the place. Um, so that, that's what a propagator is. So the, the, then the question starts to arise with, with provenance is, if I had several sources of truth, I think Alexi's example was, let's say you have a, like a building and you have, um, and like there's, a, there's this old physics problem of somebody hands you a barometer, how do you measure the height of a building? Like you can, you can stand at the top of the building holding the barometer in your hand and you can try and read the barometer which, and look at the difference in pressure and hope that maybe you can get a little bit of information. And yes, I'll, I'll totally turn off autofocus on the note camera next time. This is my first time trying to use one and it's, and it's focused way too close to the, um, the paper and yeah, I'll, I'll fix that next time. Um, uh, you could throw the barometer off the side of the building and see how long it takes to hit the ground. Uh, that actually is probably one of the better options. You could um, measure the length of the shadow of the building and then measure the length of the shadow of your barometer. 
Each one of these is going to give you a different way to measure the height of a building. Um, and you're going to get a pile of equations that maybe what you want to do is um, you can sell the barometer to the janitor to get the specs for the building. Um, there's all sorts of options, right? Um, and the idea is that each one of these techniques ha is like a different provenance of information. And when you combine information of those different provenances, you can get more and more accurate estimates of the height of the building. You can walk up, you can like use the barometer as a ruler. If you have some way to measure the height of a barometer, etc. So, um, one of the examples he starts with is to build a, a notion of a propagator for, um, interval arithmetic, and then he uses prominence to narrow the intervals that he gets. <laughs> Inbuilt stereo vision and look at the object in the ground, yes. Um, but all of these are going to have different error bars, and then eventually you're going to turn around and come up with two techniques that could contradict each other. So what you start trying to do is find the sets of like maximal provenance, the like what things, what what is the least amount of information I can get, to get or the least amount of assumptions I can make, or fewest techniques I can use together to get the best estimates. Um, and then when they disagree, uh, provenance doesn't say really like, um, like which one's really wrong, but it just says this internally consistent worldview is incompatible with that internally consistent worldview. Um, so one idea here is instead of like dealing with this joint semi lattice, what you do is you kind of, you build the, like the power set of all of the sources of truth and you build functions from those to the join semi lattice that you had before. And this is the notion that comes from that AI paper, that, that, that book on um, Lisp AI things from the 70s that I can't remember the name of, which is referenced in Rudul's paper. Um, the problem with that approach is that it's too big, it's too slow. Uh, it's, you're, gonna, you're turning a, something that should take so much time into something that takes that much space. And so um, we, can, we can work smarter. And one idea is to instead um, play games with building join sem building like a ladder of join semi lattices. I can take the product of like a integer where I have a, a lattice that looks like this, like just an ascending chain, zero, one, two, three of like what epoch number I'm on, and the original problem that I had. And we can view this as if I if I take the product of these two lattices. Basically, what I do is I get a copy of this for each one of the nodes in my chain. And then this number can be used to say, well, this is attempt number one, and we'll do a thing. And then since propagators are always going to make progress that moves upward in my join semi lattice, we can move up to the next step. So the, the approach that I have for dealing with providence is to sort of build the um, the lattice of um, switching to the next steps and then driving a propagator problem to solve it. So this was this is the stuff that I've talked about in I gave a Boston Haskell talk on propagators. which I will link in the chat. And yes, propagators can be used for distributed programming. Uh, there's a guy, Chris Michael John, who I believe is now starting up a internship at Microsoft Research, um, who did his PhD or is, is working on his PhD um, on using a form of propagators for distributed programming. Um, he had a programming language he had called LASP that work, works in that space. Um, propagators, you can view them as a generalization of the notion of a CRDT or a C, um, in, if you're, if you're familiar with, uh, commutative or convergent replicated data types in distributed programming. So they're, they're a tool for, um, strong eventual consistency. Uh, Edmund Kate, that sounds right. I'd have to look, um, which means walking behind the green screen and fishing through my bookshelf. Close that window so I don't have a distracting video of me talking while I'm talking. All right. Um, so I think that's about everything I really wanted to say about propagators right now. The, so the main thing with um, 
uh, propagator says like the the talk I gave at Boston Haskell gives a um a, like a, a rather worked example of how to use propagators as a way for me to transfer things between different problem domains that I've worked on. Um, like use techniques to make each each individual one of them. That, use the techniques that make each of the individual problem domains that I like um, fast and then use those things. It, find whatever the underlying mathematics is behind the, the characteristics that enable those algorithms to work and then use the propagators formalism as sort of a lingua franca to, to transport those results to other spaces. So I can use the things that have been used to make SAT solvers fast in order to make um, completely unrelated propagators go fast. Um, and you can start to see the connections between like the AC3 algorithm for finite domain solvers and how SAT works and all this other stuff. Slide that into frame. There. All right. So other questions? And yeah, that is really distractingly out of focus on the camera. What would be a way to run automatic differentiation twice? Um, so there is a way. It's in the AD package. It is not pleasant. Um, there should be a sum mode or an or mode. Here it is. Um, so, um, by the way, so, uh, so, so let me, let me rephrase this. Um, it is possible to use AD, um, on a function that does AD that works, that works fine out of the box. So you can, um, one thing to note is you're probably going to have to start being very careful about using auto. The key with the AD library is the quantifiers that it uses makes it so that you can't screw up. It, it won't type check if you get the autos in the wrong place. So like if you have an AD, if you have a function that's taking a bunch of values, you may have to use auto to lift it a couple of times in order to get it into the outer AD. Any other usage of propagators? Um, there are lots of other uses of propagators. Um, I do recommend you watch. Have you seen the talk that I gave at uh, um, Yao Lambda Jam or Yao West? I don't remember which one is the one that's recorded. This talk gives a laundry list of use cases for propagators. And it was more or less an off the top of my head. I have a, I have a sheet of paper that when I was first writing them up that has probably like 300 different domains. It's a fairly general concept. Find myself using GADTs in the type of problems I just described. Which type of problems I just described? I'm sorry, I lost context. So, um, or Ralu Ralu, Ralu Ralu Ralu. Um, did that answer your question about AD? Basically, there was a article by Chung Chi Shan. Chung Chi Shan. Uh, he's got a blog, and it. Um, shoot, what was the name of this thing? He had, he had a post on confusing infinitesimals. Let me just see if I can find the post. Uh, I'm not going to be able to find the post live. Um, you'll have to ask me offline. Anyways, that, that article talks about the, the technique that I used to, to avoid quantifier confusion. Math related building sets fast. I, I I'm sorry, but I've, I've completely lost the context. Oh, um, oh, sorry. So we were, we were talking about provenance. Um, so yeah, the idea with um, 
uh, the prominence tracking stuff that I was doing here was you can um, how to put this. There, there's a there, you, you you can view this as instead of enumerating instead of building a function from the power set to a join semi lattice, what we can do is we can enumerate all the things in the power set and produce the answers in sequence. Do I happen to know why the type level nats from GHC typelets don't use suck and zero? Um, it's because um, Yavor implemented type nats and then threw them over the fence and then they've kind of languished. Um, and they're not really designed for induction or doing anything like that. So in order to do induction with um, type nats, you basically have to um, go through known nat and then play games with something like data constraint nat or something. It's really awkward to use. Are they just supposed to be used like singletons, Ed? That's all they can be used for right now. We have our first voice question. Or second. Yeah, the, I find the, the type net story that we have in GHC today really unsatisfying. All right, so we went through free monads, we went through prominence tracking in propagators. Singletons was related to type level nets. Um, yes. Is there anything more in differential programming than, uh, than AD? Do you mean just, um, is there anything more to do than just use automatic differentiation for everything? Um, well, AD has enough scope to it uh, that you can cover a lot of things. There's uh, There are some cases where you really do want a form of symbolic, uh, different, uh, derivative, uh, symbolic programming for derivatives. I, I've had some benefit, some use of using AD directly on program syntax trees to compute programs that, like if I have a expression type that happens to be a num instance, I can uh, I can use AD on it to compute the um, the derivative program that's going to compute the answer, and then I can use that to compile things out for GPUs and whatnot. There's been some there's been some papers on using symbolic differentiation in that space more directly, which have slightly better results. And arguably, the AD techniques that I've had can be seen as a I've used it can be seen as some sort of special case of that work. Um, uh, Shoyo Fujita linked to it on Twitter, and I don't have an, a link to the paper though. I'd have to I'd have to do that one offline. Feel free to shoot me an email or something. Have a regular dude. Um, you hear that dependent types are coming to Haskell. Do I know what's going on? Um, I know that Richard Eisenberg has been writing a thesis on the topic. Um, I know that it's been coming any year now for the last three or four years. So I don't really know the, the full status of it. Um, it's coming. I do find that the story for dependent types in Haskell is rather baroque um, in the sense that you need like a dozen different notions of pi and for all in order to handle the different notions of quantification that we have, um, in order to say whether or not parametricity applies or not, or other conditions. Um, and so that's somewhat unsatisfying to me. On the other hand, I do find that I use dependent types in maybe one or 2% of the code that I write. 
or I really want them in one or two percent of the code I write, right? So maybe that is the right balance for the majority of the code that gets written in Haskell. Um, it's kind of like GADTs. If I use GADTs in five to ten percent of the code that I write, then it's good that the type inference and all those other things work really well for the rest of the cases. Will it mean that types won't be fully erased at runtime, or will there only be tricks like singletons? So the idea is with um, the work on dependent Haskell is that there will be both a for all and a pi. And then there's some stuff in there that says that if you have the, like, and, you, and you, there will also be a pi with an arrow and a for all with an arrow. And I can't, can't remember exactly which points are which, except for the fact that the pies let you have values that um, depend, let you have types that depend on values obviously, and the um, arrowed versions don't get erased, if I remember right. Do I use injective uh, type classes? Do you mean type families? Um, as for injective type families, I don't tend to use them very often. I tend to wind up, I, I most for the most part, I'm able to get away with using normal type families and data families. Um, when you need them, they're they're indispensable, of course. Uh, Dem hydros, uh, yeah, for all x arrow is visible and for all x dot is invisible, um, which is, yeah, exactly. I should actually throw that up in chat so that way if this gets logged into YouTube, then someone can actually see the, the chatter. Because that was part of the promise this session was that I was going to try and get more of the text into YouTube. So that's about the, the limit of my understanding of dependent Haskell at this point. Um, is The idea is that it's going to compile down into something like the singleton stuff under the hood, but it's going to look like a dependent language. There's a, there's a lot of quirks to it, though, because like normally when you build like a dependent type theory, you're able to turn around and say, we're going to reduce everything into beta, eta, normal form, and all this kind of stuff. But that requires that your language terminates. Um, and so when you start talking about it in the context of Haskell, there's all sorts of stuff where, um, where Richard's thesis has to be very elaborate in how it allows reduction in certain contexts. That is correct. Haskell is not total. Do I think the idea of proving code instead of testing code is the future? Um, I get a lot of mileage out of proving code, even if I just prove it through using parametricity and then um, to get me very, very strong free theorems, right? If I, if I can use enough parametricity that I can turn around and say, well, this thing can't depend on the particulars of almost anything that it's working with, um, then I've constrained the space of possible programs down enough that usually testing that it's inhabited is, is enough to gain a lot of confidence. Whereas if I try and do this with just testing, I can only test like properties point-wise. So yes, I, there's a lot of benefit to the, the proving code rather than testing code. Type-driven development, PDD. Total relating to strict quality of Haskell, I'm not quite following. Um, we just don't have a totality checker in Haskell. Hey, 
Have I used Liquid Haskell? I have. Um, there's, there's actually a wonderful talk um, that was given at Boston Haskell. That's not the talk. Where is it? Ranjit Chala, there he is. So Ranjit Jala gave a like a wonderful two hour introduction session at uh, Boston Haskell that um, if, if you're interested in the idea of Liquid Haskell, I would heartily recommend uh, starting with something like that. It was it held the entire audience for like two hours, um, despite the and at all levels. Um, Liquid Haskell is a like this notion of like refinement types, which is sort of a descendant of the school of thought that um, Dana Shu's work on ESC Haskell, and um, I think she called it static contract checking at the end of it uh, was. Isn't not using undecidable instances a bit like a type level totality checker? Um, it's a it's a bit of a uh, to totality checker for the instance resolution. It's a it's a very naive totality checker. Uh, normally what you'd have is you'd have a uh, like your type level totality checker for something like Agda or something like that can can be very fancy about trying to figure out orders in which the arguments are descending or something like that. Um, whereas with the um, notion of undecidable instances or with, with decidable with the uh, normal instance resolution check, you have to make progress on all your arguments all the time when you're working up the the stack, which is quite a restrictive notion of totality check it's 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 sound obviously i'm not sure i want to write my whole programs in the type class uh relation language anyway <laughs> i'm not sure i would do either um you can write a uh um you can write a lambda calculus in like five lines worth of uh, type class instances, and then with undecidable instances turned on, and you can just um, then you can write a little value level thing that turns any program that you want to run into instance resolution. It, it, Haskell is not a strict language. Is that the reason why it does not have a totality checker? No. Uh, you can have you can build a uh, if your language is total, it doesn't matter. Uh, on paper, at least, whether you are strict or lazy. Um, the thing is that laziness like makes implementation a little bit trickier, but the um, idea of... There's, there's been some, some conflation of the idea that you should only use laziness for co-data and strictness for data. There's still plenty of cases where um, being lazy, even on your strict data... Um, can make the difference between something terminating in my lifetime or not. So, does totality imply confluence? Well, you you want confluence. Re you want like, um, sort of uh, like if you if you have two different reductions that can apply in your language, you want the you want the confluence for that, um, regardless of totality. So. It's a, they're both things that you're going to want, uh, but you want confluence regardless. Is there any work from metaprogramming in Haskell? Um, I think the, the sort of original work there was to work with um, template Haskell, obviously, um, which has proven to be rather unpopular just because template Haskell is a pain in the ass to work with. Um, and why is that, like, compared to, like, something like Scheme with macros, like, Scheme macros get to work with the fact that the entire system looks, like, really homogeneous from a syntax perspective, whereas Haskell doesn't, right? Haskell has you know, layout and data type declarations versus expressions and all things are different things. 
Um, and so the notion of doing macro expansion or doing staged metaprogramming, all these things are, are a, it's a harder problem in Haskell. I guess if you have a strict language, can't we see right away that the program is total? I can write down a program that computes the collapse conjecture in a strict language. And you just, if you give me an input, I will give you an, I will either, I'm, I may spin forever, or I might give you an answer, and I can't prove whether or not that will work. Um, you just don't necessarily, like, this is a halting problem. Do I think it makes sense to prove not only the correctness of the implementation of algorithm, but the correctness of the algorithm itself, along with its memory size consumption and complexity? Um, that starts to get really difficult. Um, there's some there's some code in Agda for talking about like the complexity class of your algorithms and stuff like that. Um, I often work with algorithms that have fancy little n alpha n bounds and stuff like that with like you know poly logs or n over log n kind of bounds because they use tricks like the four Russians problem or something like that in order to like shave a log. Like that kind of stuff is really hard to do like on paper, let alone in code. I don't know how to do it. Now, I would also be very interested in having a totality checker that can prove the collapse conjecture. Yeah, there's, there's lots of little ways to do um, like toy problems with probability, like with the um, complexity bounds in them. Um, I just don't find them interesting for anything that has appreciably complicated computer science. That Lambda Calculus via Type Glasses example written somewhere. I do not. Um, Leonard, like, or not Leonard, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Oleg blew past it in a slide at uh, ICFP 2006 um, in like five seconds. So that he might have it on his blog. If not, um, I can probably rewrite it. I'm not going to do it live on the air, though. Hmm. I have to look at the characteristic formula one. Um, there's another um, line of research here. So there's actually a language called, uh, or a, a type theory, dual light affine logic, DLAL. So DLL is a type system in which you can't think a thought that doesn't run in polynomial time. And the idea is that the type system itself picks up these funny little... Oh, I'm not showing my screen. Sorry, sorry. Um, I've probably done that for a couple of things. In my coding screen. So there's this, this notion of... It's uh, dual light affine logic. Let me paste the link to the paper into the chat. And if you look at the types, I should see some type in here for something. They start picking up these funny little section symbols in them. The pseudo term corresponding to the previous def definition is this crazy thing. And then these section symbols, each one of them represents like a, you know, um, end of the next it's like counting in unary in, in the power of your polynomial time algorithm the problem with this is that you can't write your polynomial you can prove you can prove that every polynomial time algorithm can be written in this fashion but it's not the not that you can write any all of them in a natural fashion so like this is probably the most comp complete work that I've seen in that space at least in terms of like building a type theory that can lock down those times. But it's still only going to give you, um, under this encoding of the formalism, you can do it in this polynomial time. That may not be the best bound that you can actually achieve. And anything coarser than 